All right, continuing on with our organic chemistry unit, we're on to proteins. Um, going through our organic compounds grid, we've been starting out with the basic unit, the monomer of proteins, which is a polymer, just like carbs, lipids, nucleic acids. The monomer or the basic subunit of proteins is the amino acid. Uh, the, another name for an amino acid is a peptide. Um, it's kind of reversible there. Uh, the reason they're called amino acids is because the structure here, here's a generic amino acid for you. Uh, we talked about the functional groups, the amino or the amine group, which is here, and the carboxyl or carboxylic acid group, which is here. So put those together, you have the amino group, carboxyl group, amino acid. They all have this, these components to them. They also have a carbon in the middle, this alpha carbon, with a hydrogen coming off. And then they have an R group, which is the rest of the molecule. And this is what differentiates amino acids from one another. There's 20 that exist, 20 that make up all of our proteins, and we're mostly made of protein. So it's some combination of these 20 amino acids makes everything that we are. Down here at the bottom, here's our variation of these R groups. Now it's going to be flipped upside down. They've got the H up top and the R group pointing down for these examples. Glycine, the R group is simply a hydrogen, all right? And I can circle these R groups. Well, they have them, they have them highlighted for you, so I guess I don't need to circle them. Glycine has the H for an R group. Here's the methyl. Alanine has a methyl for an R group. Valine, there's its differentiating R group, leucine, isoleucine, etc. So they all have these things in common and they're dif differentiated according to those R groups. Whether it's a, a hydrocarbon chain or some rings, that's what makes them different. Once again, I said they're called peptides. If we move on to the types, you could have a single peptide, one um, alone. You could have two peptides bonded together. That would form a dipeptide. Um, and peptides, just like anything else in organic chemistry, they go together using dehydration synthesis. And here's how that works. Here's a peptide. Here's a peptide. Once again, you need to borrow an OH from this carboxyl group, an H from the amino group, put them together. Water's leaving, and a, this bond extends to this nitrogen. Here it is. There's our peptide bond. So this would be a dipeptide, two peptides put together. You put three or more peptides, you get a polypeptide. A protein is also called a polypeptide because it's a whole bunch of amino acids or a whole bunch of peptides put together. It's important, when we're synthesizing amino acids or synthesizing peptides, we have to do so in this fashion. We need the carboxyl group to be facing the amino group. We can't add carboxyl to carboxyl. We can't add amino to amino. We have to add carboxyl to amino. So here's our types. Peptide, here's a peptide. Dipeptide, there's a dipeptide. And polypeptide, if we were to add another uh, amino acid to this chain. How about examples? Well, an enzyme is one example. Um, what do enzymes do? They speed up reactions. How does that happen? Well. Here's a typical rate of reaction. If we have the reactants up here, the products down here. We've talked about in class, or perhaps we haven't, but we, we, uh, reactions occur in order to find stability. Old bonds break, new bonds form. Why? Because you want lower potential energy. The lower the energy, the more stability there is. If you're at the top of a cliff, you have higher potential energy, you're less stable than if you're at the bottom. So here's our reactants, where they say they're up here on the cliff. In order to get most reactions happening, you need some input of energy. You need to light a match, you need to turn the burner on uh, if you're boiling water. And you have to get the reaction over this hump. You have to get it started, input some energy, input some energy, and boom, it goes. And you get the reactants down here. It's this input of energy that determines how fast that reaction is going to happen, how spontaneously it's going to happen. If there's a huge input of energy that's required, that reaction isn't going to happen all that spontaneously, all that quickly. 
So you input the energy, it goes, energy is released, the products are down here at the bottom, um, they're more stable. That's why this happens. Enzymes do this. They speed up reactions by lowering this curve, by lowering the amount of energy that needs to be input for this reaction to take place. This is the activation energy. It shows you right here. Without the enzyme, it's very high, high activation energy. With it, brings it down to here. So this, this reaction is going to be much more spontaneous, much quicker in the presence of the enzyme. Just have to get over this hump instead of get, getting over this one. Now physically, uh, this is a simplified picture of an enzyme. This would be the active site. It's kind of a lock and key method where the substrate, which would be the enzyme that's going to be acted upon, the substrate fits into the active site. And when it does, it, it, it produces the enzyme substrate complex. Let me write that on here. All right, this is the substrate, this is the enzyme. It fits into the active site. All right, this is this area that, that the substrate is going to fit into in the lock and key method. And when they are together, they form the enzyme substrate complex. Pretty intuitive, I think. So now, let's say that this reaction that's being sped up, uh, A is reacting with B. That's going to go in, the reaction is going to get sped up, it's going to get acted upon by the enzyme, the activation energy lowers, and What's happening? Well, the products then leave. Let's say the products are C and D. Our overall reaction, A plus B, yields C and D. A and B went in, got acted upon, sped up. The products, C and D, then leave. These are what enzymes do. Enzymes get affected by temperature. Sometimes high temperatures can denature enzymes, can damage them. That's denaturation. I'll write that word up here. Denaturation is some kind of event that uh, causes, well, it is the actual damage to the enzyme, whether it's pH, whether it's high temperature. Makes them inoperable, so obviously that's not going to be good for your body if your enzymes aren't working. All enzymes end in ASE, like amylase, which is an enzyme in your saliva, like lactase which is an enzyme that breaks down lactose, which is in dairy products. If you don't have lactase, you're lactose intolerant. So an enzyme is an example of a protein. Structural proteins, look at this guy. He's got quite a bit of keratin in this stash. Keratin is a structural protein uh, that's in hair, it's in fingernails, it's in the horns of this big horn sheep here. Uh, collagen is actually the most abundant protein in mammals makes up your skin, makes up your connective tissue, ligaments, tendons. Actin and myosin are proteins that are really important in um, flexing of muscles. So those are structural proteins. Transport proteins are in your, recall this should look familiar, this is that phospholipid bilayer. We talked about this when we were talking about lipids. These are phospholipids with the phosphate head and the fatty acid tails. These are hydrophobic. The heads are hydrophilic. These are transport proteins. They allow things to come in and out of cells. So let's go back. All right, transport proteins embedded within the phospholipid bilayer of cells. Hormones are chemical messengers released by the hypothalamus, by the pituitary gland. They give uh, send chemical signals throughout the body. They cause physical change, they cause um, different emotional responses, um, testosterone, estrogen, uh, the fight or flight, adrenaline is a hormone. And antibodies, okay? They help you fight out off foreign substances. Disease, all right? Like germs, all right? Very prevalent now this time of year. Uh, that's what antibodies do. So protein's very, very important to us. Uh, hopefully that all helped you in your understanding of them.